The People's Democratic Party, PDP, has condemned Friday and Sunday fresh attack on the convoy of Boronu State Governor Babagana Zulum by insurgents. The ambush led to the killing of security operatives attached to the governor. In a statement issued by a National Publicity Secretary, Kola Olubodinho, the main opposition party said the repeated attack on the governor, as well as the rising wave of terrorist attacks, reinforced apprehensions of security compromises and lapses which it maintained underpinned the necessity to immediately rejig the nation's security apparatus. The PDP said it is alarmed by the frightening situation where insurgents now have the temerity of repeated attacks on the armed convoy of a state governor, which according to the party highlights the nightmare being witnessed by ordinary compatriots. And uh, security experts uh, Onna Ehomo and uh, Kabir Adamu join us via Zoom to discuss these attacks on the convoy of the Borno State Governor Babagana Zulumba insurgents. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Kabir, my first question is to you. Uh, we can take our eyes off the Borno State as it is um, by the day worrying, but consistently Governor Zulum has shown strength and courage. What needs to be done, however, to secure his safety? Um, I, I, it will start with his own perception of safety. In security risk management, we talk about risk appetite. Um, some have a very low risk appetite, while others have um, high, high. It appears Governor Zulum himself has a very high risk appetite, and perhaps deriving from his a time as the commissioner of um, you know rural reconstruction and development um, he has been to all the 27 local governments he's worked closely with um, officials of the state in developing those local governments so it appears he has not changed his mindset from when he was a commissioner to now that he's a governor um, of course he's a high um, risk um, target the insurgents would want to do away with him it will help them in achieving the objective of setting up a caliphate so I think he needs to realize that and then take his security more seriously. Um, the second component is his uh, protection team, the executive protection team around him. What kind of arrangements do they have in place to ensure that this, this type of attacks against him are either completely eliminated or reduced to the barest minimum? We talk about an advanced team that goes ahead of an executive. Now that advanced team is supposed to make sure that the environment is okay before the principal arrives. We're not sure that type of arrangement is in place for the governor. The third part is the aerial surveillance that is absolutely necessary. If there was an effective aerial surveillance um, for the governor, the types of incidences that have occurred in the last few days probably would have been averted. The aerial surveillance would, would be able to see over a long distance so that when an attack is coming, they can warn the ground team and then the ground team would take the appropriate measures. In the case, the two at last attacks that occurred, one of them was a road planted IED. Now, if there was an advanced team and aerial surveillance, that would have been detected. The governor would have been warned, or his convoy would have been warned. The second one we had was a donkey. Now, in a place where there were no human you know, ha 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 habitation. Now, if um, there was an aerial surveillance and an advanced team, all of this would have been detected. So it's a combination of himself his executive team, and then more importantly, the military deployment, Operation Life Aduli, that is meant to provide a stable environment for all residents of Borno State, as well as the Lake Chad Basin. Unfortunately, it appears that what the ordinary resident of Borno is facing is what the governor encountered. So I think a combination of all of these three things would hopefully lead to a better security for the governor. All right, I'm going to um, reach out to Mr. Ekomo now. You, you had released a, a press statement uh, calling for robust executive uh, protection uh, for the governor. Uh, why is this all important, you know, right now? Thank you very much for having me on your program. Well, I, I think, um, like Kabir said, the governor is a high um, target, is a, you know, a very visible target. And if these bad guys can, um, in fact, um, accomplish their mission, which is to eliminate him, then they would uh, really score a very big one. And uh, it will underscore also the point that uh, a lot of people have been making that uh, Nigeria is presenting uh, evidence that it's probably becoming a, a failed state or 
we are sliding into a Hobbesian state of nature. And uh, so I think um, uh, protecting the governor by all means, because um, what is happening right now is that Gov uh, Governor Zulu might be just uh, the governor of Borno State, but he's a wartime governor. He's on the front lines of a hot war. And I don't understand why uh, the uh, steps that uh, Mr. Kabir has uh, uh, enumerated here, they are not being taken, and even more uh, to ensure that um, uh, the governor is adequately protected. Uh, you know, when you are in going into a war zone, or when you are in a war zone, then you have to get uh, protection, uh, you know, that is commensurate to the threat in there. That is a, the function of vulnerability assessment, and uh, which these people are supposed to know how to do uh, anyhow uh, in this context. So I think um, it's really very unfortunate that we are seeing repeated attacks on him. And let me tell you, uh, it's simple probability. If they try enough time, they might in fact succeed. And we don't want that to happen by any means, because this is a young man who is working very hard for his state and so on and so forth. But let me go to another point that was made in my press release. Now, if, it's, um, if the environment is so uh, volatile, is so uh, threat-filled, the threat scape is so high that uh, the governor is constantly coming under attack, then I wonder why there's a rush to move those people back into Baga, where they might become uh, uh, lambs for slaughter. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that's also a mistaken strategy, and that should be looked at. But let's focus right now on protecting the governor. I I'll stay with you, Mr. Ekwamu. Um, you, when you say uh, the governor must be protected by all means in a volatile environment like that, um, what do you mean exactly, and how can that be replicated for the people of the state? Well, thank you. The problem is the protection we give to the chief executive is not the same we can give to, let's say, a, a farmer in, uh, uh, or a fisherman in Baga. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the same. That's why I'm saying um, we need to look at the needs for uh, the security of uh, the uh, citizens of Baga, um, separate from what we are doing for the governor. However, the governor is on a totem pole, he's on a pedestal. And so if anything happens to him, you are going to have that on CNN, and you're going to have that all over the, on your network, on uh, Plus TV Africa, saying that uh, something has, uh, uh, untoward has happened to the governor. After all, Boko Haram slaughters people every day in Borno State, but you don't get it on, uh, it doesn't make your uh, 7 a.m. news. But this is on your 7 a.m. news because it's a big item. Now, how do we do it? That's the question. Uh, first of all, I think we really need to sit down and rethink, like uh, Kabir said, rethink the executive protection detail for uh, the governor. And that's what I meant in that release when I said a robust um, uh, executive protection detail. We need to look at, again, what is the philosophy, what we're trying to go look at the risk assessments, like uh, he has said also, and say, okay, this is what we really need to do and, and that and the other. We need to look at the enemy, uh, in this case, Baba Boko, uh, Iswap. We need to look at them. What is it? What are they really trying to achieve? Why do they want to target VIPs for elimination? And we know some of them already. It gives them a, a notoriety, a, a bonus points. Um, it helps them propagate their Wahhabi Salafism uh, and so on and so forth. There are so many things there that they gain from it. And most importantly, it also shows that uh, they are in fact uh, above the law. Uh, so it uh, underscores their impunity, as it were. But now, how do we protect the governor? We need to go back again and train and retrain that first we need to strengthen the team around him. That's capability. We need to get more guys here, give them good gear. We need to improve their processes, as it were. Uh, whatever process it is, there are process mapping methods that can be used for executive mapping, uh, for executive protection. And Kapiri has mentioned one or two. And then we need to um, uh, give training, driver training for his um, uh, drivers, uh, with people in the key convoy have uh, different rings of protection for an executive. You need to give proper driver training such that even when you run into an ambush, you can fight your way out of the ambush, even just with your um, uh, uh, driving team. So there's a lot of uh, stuff in there. There's a lot of details, some of which you have in the uh, release already with you, and uh, that need to be executed so that we can, in fact, reach a robust level 
that is adequate for protecting a wartime governor. All right, I'm going to go back to Kapira Damu. Uh, yesterday we had, uh, we started a conversation on the possibility of a sabotage in the security uh, team of the governor. Um, so I want you to quickly speak on that. And then second, what does this really say about the um, success recorded so far in the fight against terrorism and insurgency in Borno State? If, you know, we currently have a governor that, you know, is almost, you know, having to stay back in government house uh, because of uh, you know, consistent attacks. Well, um, the reality is that the um, vulnerability that exists within Borno State and the general Lake Chad area is quite high. Um, you know, just to give you a context, if you are within the center of the big cities, there are 27 local governments, if you are within the centers of those big cities, then the risk is low. Um, the likelihood is that it's a garrison town. So even um, Baga, as an example, which is Kukawa local government, if you are within the, the city center of Baga, you are likely to be safe. But the moment you come out five kilometers, you know, upwards, 10, 10, 15 kilometers, then the risk of an attack by any of the two or three insurgent groups that are active in that area is quite high. And then we know that there are about three camps of these insurgent groups in, in, the, in that general area. So in the Lake Chad Basin, there are islands that are being dominated and occupied by these guys. Then if you go to Sambisa Forest, you have that. Then of course, in the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, there are camps there. Um, what the million dollar question that has not been answered by the military as it were is why they've not raided those camps and frankly, um, you know, done away with them to, to rubbles. Um, as long as those camps remain, it means these guys are able to launch their attacks, and that's why we're seeing the type of attacks. Um, another very key component is what they call, what we call illegal checkpoints by these guys. So the moment you are moving between point A and point B, as an example, the governor was moving from Monguno to Baga, and then the, his convoy was ambushed. That is how, on a daily basis, um, residents who are moving you know, for daily business are also ambushed and sometimes kidnapped, other times killed, and then in other instances robbed by, by, by these guys. So this, this is the reality on ground. Forget what you are hearing about, you know, the group has been eliminated or all that. Almost on a daily basis, we keep tabs of this development and they are occurring. So life, as it were, in, the, in Borno State and the Lake Chad Basin is unfortunately at a very, very low ebb because of this ki kind of in instances. Now, um, for that type of environment, how do you explain, knowing this as, in, as a risk management practitioner, I know this reality, how do you explain the governor taking himself into such an environment? Um, it, it, it beats me, really, without the adequate protection as, as outlined by Dr. Ekoma and myself. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Kabir, when, when you say that um, without adequate security, from the videos we've seen after the event, we saw that there were a large number of security detail with the governor. Uh, you're also saying that there are camps there that needs to be uh, rooted out. Then, obviously, there is something wrong with the strategy of operations, um, knowing that the governor has been a target lately. What would you say to that? Um, in simple terms, um, security effectiveness of a security program is not about numbers. It has to do with the strategy. You mentioned strategy. Um, what kind of deployment? Um, in our discussion, myself and Dr. Ona, we talked about um, aerial surveillance as an example. Um, you can sit where you are in Lagos and have better surveillance than, than someone in, in, in Baga or Meduguri using technology as an example. We have um, close air support by the Nigerian Air Force. Why was that missing? I mean, with close air support, um, from, with, with a good vision, you can see enemies that are coming from hundreds of miles away. In this instance, it's a desert terrain. If they are moving in vehicles as they usually do, there will be a large you know, pool of dust, as it were, and you'll be able to see that with good communication. You can communicate with troops on ground. Look, there are birds coming your way from this direction. These are the number of birds. This is what they are holding. We didn't see all of that. All we saw are numbers. And frankly, even the, the response after the, 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 the sound of gunshot that came was not properly managed. You have a principal that was left almost unprotected 
with, with a good marksman, unfortunately, he would have been taken, taken out. So there are lapses that in, in terms of strategy. We saw numbers, but though that number was, was not effective, in, as it were, in, in protecting the governor. So um, all of these points have been outlined, and there, there, there is a need for a critical evaluation of both um, the capacity, the capability, as well as the response strategy by the, the executive team um, of, of the governor. I mentioned earlier on in my remarks that he himself needs to take his security seriously. He's now a governor, he's no more a commissioner. Um, his value has increased tremendously. And with that value means the security capabilities and capacity needs, needs to be increased to meet what he, his value is as a governor. Imagine a situation where the president is going to Baga. You can imagine the, the type of security arrangement that will be put in place. Likewise, if the governor is going to Baga, that is how I expect um, the security arrangement to be. Uh, if there was close air support, um, nobody has come, come out to tell us. Neither the military in their statement, the police have mentioned close air support. So if close air support was missing, why? And it doesn't really make sense to me. We're talking of a location that is of high risk, and the governor is going to that location without adequate security, in simple terms, clearly. So um, as a risk management expert, if I do my evaluation, the evaluation will come to a conclusion. Um, high risk, low, uh, medium risk, or low risk. If it's high risk, why, why would I continue the, the journey? Um, my work as an executive team um, you know, leader, commander, is to lower that risk. And clearly, whoever is responsible. All right. Um, let's uh, quickly go back to uh, Mr. Ekomo as uh, we uh, continue with uh, this conversation. Uh, I, I want to know also your thoughts on what might be causing uh, this level of boldness uh, with the insurgents. Um, and, you know, is it high time that the, of course, security architecture in the state takes the fights to them? Um, uh, because you know, if we keep talking about the governor being attacked every time that he drives out of, you know, government house, at what point, you know, can we be sure that we have completely eliminated uh, the threats that exist in Borno State? Well, that is at the point uh, thank you again, sir, for the uh, question. That is at the point where there are, there are no further attacks, whether on citizens or whether on uh, the governor and his convoy, um, which is what is desired, which is what is supposed to be. That is the purpose of the modern nation state. The nation state says, give me your obedience as a citizen and I will provide protection for you. That's the famous uh, section in our constitution that is often quoted, that the welfare and security of citizens uh, is the first uh, job of government. Uh, now, uh, how do you provide that uh, uh, welfare and uh, security? It is by uh, having um, your armed forces. Uh, this goes to the principle of sovereignty uh, of the nation state. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, having your armed forces, Westphalian Treaty, if you like, 1645, uh, having your armed forces, having your police, having the apparatus, that is the uh, instruments of coercion, uh, such that uh, there will be a centrality of authority, people, there will be safety of lives and property, and so on and so forth. But what we see in the Northeast, and in fact, not just Northeast, uh, in the Northwest too, and the most part, uh, South, in the Middle Belt, um, look at what happened recently in, um, uh, in Plateau State uh, with the killing, that's an, another executive protection incident killing of uh, a monarch in backing Ladi local government. So what I'm trying to say is uh, the, the security uh, is a good, it's, it's actually a good, it's a condition that must be assured by those who with the instruments of coercion uh, in a modern uh, 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 state, in a nation state. Demo, uh, let's ask, Nigeria is democratic because we have the instruments of democracy. So we say modern democratic state. But having said that, um, th there are many things uh, wrong here um, uh, about taking the fight to them. Yes, sure, we can take the fight to them, but that's just a manner of speaking. Uh, like uh, Mr. Kabiri has uh, told you where they are, their encampments, uh, but uh, it, it is easier. Take uh, Sambiza Forest, for example. The size of Sambiza Forest uh, 
the whole 100,000 troops we have cannot garrison that uh, uh, Samiza forest alone. So that's why you see Camp Zero falls, the military withdraws and goes to do its thing, and then the insurgents are back in there. Remember, this is asymmetrical warfare. This is not like uh, fighting Togo or Cameroon or somebody where you go, uh, when you capture the capital and you pacify the uh, outlying areas, you declare uh, that uh, you have won which is conventional warfare. This is asymmetrical warfare. Anywhere the guys show up, like uh, we said, they use the donkey uh, to uh, cause an attack. You know, I mean, anywhere they show up, and as long as they blow up something or blow up themselves or, or and then kill people or make whatever noise or whatever it is, uh, on, cause inconvenience, on. cause harm, create fear, they have won. And so we need to rethink um, our own strategies right. for protection to understand that we are dealing with uh, asymmetrical warfare. All right, hold on, Mr. Ikomo. I, I, I want, I want to, I want to pick up from. Exist, uh, hold on, sir. I want to pick up from for um, a point that you've just made with regards the size of uh, Sambiza Forest. Um, this has been a conversation that we've had uh, for the longest time about how big it is and how you know difficult it might be to completely comb and flush. A terrorist um, and insurgents out of that area. Um, Kabir Adam, I, I want you to speak on, on this. Um, how do you think that we have failed to improve and, uh, and increase on the you know, manpower of um, the Nigerian army and all security agencies in the last 10 years uh, to ensure that, I mean, 10 years is enough time to have combed the forest. Um, so how do you think that we maybe could have done better um, over time? Uh, the, the manpower capability of the Nigerian Air Force is, is a function of the type of assignments that they, they have to contend with. Um, one of the key, uh, I would say, lapses of our democratic growth is the involvement of the military in internal security matters, which, as you are aware, is not their core function. Um, the internal security department, the police, the civil defense, and several others uh, are the ones that should be leading that. Unfortunately, the military is now having to deal with internal security matters. And that, that clearly explains why they are stretched. Um, and the last count, the military was involved in 28 um, different states uh, involved in one or the other uh, military operation, which are internal security matters. The best example that I would give for that is Operation Safe Haven in Plateau State, extended to Southern Kaduna. That operation was meant to last for months, as it were, as, as the name suggests, an operation. But today, almost a decade down the road, 12 years, if I'm right, that operation is still ongoing. Um, from what, what was meant to be a stopgap arrangement, it, is, it has now become fully embedded. Now, time will not allow us to go into the analysis of why military operations that are supposed to be stopgaps uh, now extending into 12, 12 years or even longer. Um, I just gave this to explain to you why the military is stretched with a capacity of about 120,000 thereabout. They are involved in 28 um, states, uh, internal operations. And now that they have a real warfare in their hands in the Northeast, um, they are finding it difficult really to provide the manpower to carry out that operation. Every time they would have to redeploy from some of these existing 28 states operations back to the northeast, a gap is created in, in those locations where they are, they are, they are, they are, they are working. Um, one of the cardinal objectives of this government is to change this arrangement and ensure the internal security department, the police and the others um, have the capacity to take up this responsibility by the military. Unfortunately, that has remained a dream. Uh, the, it's a work in progress, and we're hoping that uh, you know in the coming years, the capacity of the police is improved in such a way that they can take up this responsibility that the military is currently handling. All right, let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Ekum. Uh, you released a statement on this particular issue. You talked about, you know, um, evolving a robust protection for the uh, governor, Zulum. My question to you would be, what are the major recommendations you would put forward to address this issue? Thank you very much. I think um, the first of all, we need to look at um, the need for strategy. We have said that here. 
and uh, need to involve, uh, you know, to get more training for the people. So it's not just about the numbers, like uh, Mr. Kabir said. Uh, it's about their effectiveness. And then uh, you need to look at uh, the use of technology. Now, if you triangulate like that, you know, what is the thinking that's going into uh, the planning, the thinking that's going into the executive protection, the risk assessments, vulnerability assessments, and so on. And then you look at, uh, not just in terms of numbers, adequate training, equipment. Uh, people are carrying AK-47 uh, rifle. They cannot match somebody carrying a double-A gun uh, somewhere because the double-A gun will hit them from a further uh, uh, range. And, uh, you know, so you have to look at the equipment. So you must assess the enemy. Uh, we we'll call it threat vulnerability integration. You must look at the capabilities of the enemy. You know, what is he carrying? What does he have? Uh, and how is he going to threaten uh, your uh, uh, executive? So we must have that uh, knowledge uh, component. We must have the uh, personnel component and their equipping and their training um, you know, uh, very importantly. Then we must now look also at technologies because we must think out of the box. Um, you know, he said just now, Mr. Kabir said that, that the, we are working in a, a desert Sahelia zone. So it's easy to surveil things. Now, if you have a situation where you have a lot of uh, uh, shrubbery, uh, that's uh, like uh, foliage cover, it's tougher to use uh, aerial surveillance. But you know, when you have, um, uh, you know, open desert areas, it's so easy. Uh, so I don't know why this is not being done. I think the problem really is that uh, the governor had not been tested the way it's being tested right now. Uh, I mean, that's the executive reputation team has not been tested, which is why we have security experts like uh, Kabir and myself, because you're supposed to anticipate the threats and mitigate them before they become lost events. Because All right, Mr. Ekomo, been um, I'm afraid that that's the month time. Friday, you know, they might even have taken him away. Uh, I'm way, sorry to interject, away, but that is the uh, month time for permission, took sir. away uh, APC, uh, that's how more personnel carriers and stuff like that. You know, so, I mean... It, it, that, I don't think Mr. Friday Ikomu can hear me, but we want to say thank you very much to the both of you for joining us on The Breakfast this morning. Your time and your input is appreciated. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, actually. And, you know, I've, I've mostly just been concerned about the boldness, we you know, with which these insurgents, you know, um, now uh, carry out attacks. It it's must be really frightening. Uh, living in a state where they are now bold enough to attack the governor's convoy. Now, um, quite unfortunate. That, this course, conversation was started yesterday, yeah. and uh, we just wanted to take um, you know a bigger perspective on how the the architecture should be revamped. Some are saying, I mean, sacking the service chiefs is not the answer, and they didn't even uh, go to that as one that. of the solutions. You know, but hopefully, conversations like this will continue to. Uh, push for the right uh, actions to be taken to protect not just the governor, uh, but the people it of Boronu State. And, you know, it, it also, you know, one of the things that I also spoke uh, to Kabir about was, you know, how this really exposes or tells us where we are with regards to um, the fight against insurgency. Indeed. Um, how much success have we recorded over, the t over time? Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.